Today Israel is a spectacular country, with breathtaking skylines like the one in Tel Aviv, extraordinary properties in the lowest place on earth, the Dead Sea, peaceful and rich in agriculture area of the Sea of Galilee, desolate but rich with treasures, the Judean desert, and finally the jewel that dwarfs everything, Jerusalem, with its layers of historical and religious significance. And you can see everything I mentioned and much more in this tiny country called Israel. How small, you may ask? Well, let's compare it to America. Thankfully, today we have tools that help us to do this. So let's put Israel next to America and you can see exactly how big it is. It's a tiny, tiny country. Just to give you another orientation point, it takes three hours to travel from Beersheba to Tel Dan, so the dimensions we are given in the Bible. So imagine this, in a single day you can wander the desert with 40 degrees Celsius, then have a swim in the Mediterranean Sea and at the end of the day go skiing at Mount Hermon. But unfortunately, there is also a second side to Israel. Tensions are also rising in the north with a potential second front in the war along Israel's border with Lebanon. We begin with terrifying developments in the Middle East that could change the region forever. We now know that Hamas is threatening to execute an Israeli civilian hostage every time that an airstrike hits Gaza civilians in their homes without warning. Tonight in Tel Aviv, images that change everything in an escalation that has already spiralled so fast. Israel's missile defence systems lighting up the sky as they try to intercept incoming Hamas rockets. 130 of them were fired from Gaza in one barrage. Flights at the international airport were urgently suspended and diverted. Israel and the Arab people in the region are constantly fighting, leaving casualties on all sides. Since Israel's creation in 48, the tension between the nation and its neighbors is ever growing. Today I want to discuss this conflict and give you a historical perspective on this fight for the Holy Land. Because only if we understand history and the facts, we can fairly judge what is happening in Israel. But before we will do that, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video and hit that bell button. This really takes a second, but it's a great help for me. So thank you for everybody who is doing it. So let's discuss the history of Israel. A crucial element of understanding the structure of the Middle East is the influence of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire began expanding in the 13th century and quickly became the most influential force in the Near East. It was a totally new quality in the region that would last for centuries. The Ottoman Empire used a temporal vacuum in the region where the Abuid Caliphate was declining and there was really nobody that could challenge this new force. And so you can see now on this map how the empire grew and developed over the years. And really from the beginning of the 16th century the Ottomans ruled the Holy Land. This is also when they built the famous walls of the old city of Jerusalem. But there are two reasons why I wanted us to start with the Ottoman Empire. So the first thing that we must understand is that at that time in this region we didn't have countries like we have them today. So you didn't have a country like Egypt, like Jordan, like Syria, like Iraq, like Israel. You didn't even have a country like Turkey. And this situation lasted for a very long time. Remember, the Ottoman Empire lasted from the 13th century 
to the 20th century so seven centuries so instead of countries you had provinces regions that were subjected to the ottoman empire so for example the region that most interests us so the territories of the land that we know today as Israel was called Beirut Vilayet and then you had for example the Mustafariyet of Jerusalem so the territory that is today within Israel in the Ottoman Empire was actually divided into two parts and the two regions were Beirut Vilayet and the Mustafariyet of Jerusalem but certainly not what the Palestinian claim that it was called Palestine. No, it's not true. In fact, there never was a country like Palestine. And yet every time you turn on the news, you hear of this mystical country that was taken from the Palestinian people. But where do we get this name? Where did it came from? Well, we have to go back even further to understand this. We have to go as far as the first century AD where another second Jewish revolt began against the Romans. Remember, this is several decades after the first Jewish revolt which the Jewish people lost and now the Romans begin to install Roman culture in Jerusalem and that obviously was not accepted by the Jews so they started another revolt against the Romans initially they were successful they destroyed some legions even in the city but eventually the Romans totally crushed the whole city and called it Alia Capitolina a new name for Jerusalem the outcome of this revolt was very tragic for the Jewish people the Romans not only destroyed Jerusalem, but also burned many cities in Judea, killing over half a million Jewish people in the process. This totally changed the structure of this region. For the Romans, Judea just stopped existing and the region was renamed Syria-Palestina. And this is where we get the name Palestine from. The Romans were so angry at the Jews that they decided they will rename their region where they lived after their biggest enemies, the Philistines. And the Philistines were invaders from the Aegean region, so around Greece, that settled in the area that we know today as Gaza. But what is important to understand is that you won't find any Philistines today. Philistine and its cities were totally destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. And so Philistine ceased to exist in the 6th century BC. And this is a very important point. The people that live today in Gaza and are called Palestinians have nothing to do with the ancient Philistines. To say it simply, they have inherited the name of people who do not exist today. So let's summarize what we have already established. During the Ottoman Empire, there was no such country as Palestine. This is very important because after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, which I will talk about in a moment, new countries are formed. And it's important to remember that there never was a country called Palestine and the lands that we know today as Israel, Judea and Samaria, Gaza, they were called a very specific name under the Ottoman Empire. So that's very important. No Palestine before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Second, what we have also established is that the name of Palestine actually comes from an ancient people that was given to this area by the Romans who hated the Jews. 
Today those people do not exist and the modern people that call themselves Palestinians have nothing to do with the Philistines. But let's go back to the Ottoman Empire because there is another myth that needs to be addressed. You can often hear this narrative that the Jews took this wonderful land from the Palestinians and now they are enjoying it and the Palestinians are suffering. You heard that, right? Israel today is a miracle, a beautiful country, but it wasn't the promised land during the Ottoman Empire. During the 19th century, a famous American writer known as Mark Twain visited the land, and this is what he wrote about it. We traverse some miles of desolate country whose soil is rich enough, but is given over wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole route. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. So, not exactly the picture of the promised land, is it? But there is a reason for that. You see, during the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans put a special tax on any tree that is grown in this region. And what ended up happening is that everybody was cutting trees to avoid the taxes. And without trees, the land became barren. Just take a look at some of those pictures of Jerusalem before the establishment of the modern state of Israel. So for example, look at this spot here. This is the location of the city of David. Look how little development is in this area. And now compare it to the modern picture showing you the city of David. You can see that there is much more development here now. And what is shocking is that people didn't even know that this is the location of the city of David. They were growing potatoes before the establishment of the modern state of Israel in this exact spot. Here is another picture of the Damascus Gate located in East Jerusalem. Today, the majority of people that live in this area are Arabs. Now compare it to the modern view of the Damascus Gate. Might be a nice view here from those walls. Okay, so the Damascus Gate and the busyness of the Muslim quarter. And we are standing on the ancient walls of Jerusalem. And here's another historical picture showing you the old city of Jerusalem from above. Notice how little development is around the old city. And here's a modern view of today's Jerusalem. And look how much development has happened since Israel became a country again. You wanna do one more? Let's do one more. Here is a historical picture showing you a view on the southern part of the Temple Mount. Please look at this area here. What do you see in this area? Well, you see nothing, just ground, right? Now, look at the same place in today's Jerusalem. And what do you see? A wealth of archaeological evidence and I guarantee you if Israel wasn't created again in this place there still would be soil and nothing more and this story we see all over Israel places that were desolate were transformed into a beating with life cities so additionally to our previous two points we add a third one that the land was desolate after the Ottoman Empire. This is a very important observation that we should remember. 
It wasn't a promised land. It wasn't a land filled with milk and honey. But before I will move on, I want to go back again to the Roman Empire and specifically the time of the Second Jewish Revolt. The Romans not only destroyed the Jewish cities, killed the Jewish people, but also they have exiled them. And this exile, sometimes called the second exile, the first one being the Babylonian one, lasted for almost 2,000 years. And that particular exile literally fulfilled God's promise that if the nation will be disobedient, he will scatter them to all corners of the earth. And it's really incredible if you think about it, you can find Jewish communities everywhere on earth, from Japan to Australia, France, Russia, Ethiopia, Brazil, and even Alaska. Just listen to this. The Lord will scatter you among all the peoples, from one end of the earth to the other. This was a very strong warning to the people of Israel before they entered the land. God did warn them that if they will not behave in the land according to his laws, he will start judging them. But after the end of all those warnings, there is a word of hope. God says that because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, after he will scatter the people, there will be a time when he will bring them back from all corners of the earth to the promised land. And this must be the most amazing promise for us, because we are witnessing it today. Let us remember, this promise is given to Israel even before they enter the land for the first time. Before they are exiled the first time, the second time, God tells them that he will bring them back from all corners of the earth. And what has started in the 20th century and what we are witnessing now is the return of the Jewish people from all corners of the earth and establishing a nation of Israel in the promised land. Again, I want to encourage you, if you don't have a lot of belief in the Bible, think about this prophecy. It was given thousands of years ago, and now it is happening. It is happening after centuries of disbelief, of saying it's a myth, it will never happen, there will be no more Israel. Israel has been punished by God, and they will never have a nation again. This is what people were saying before the creation of Israel in the 20th century. So in the last part of my video, I want to discuss this. What has brought us here and how did it start? So once again, we have to go back to the Ottoman Empire because in the 20th century, something extraordinary happened. World War I finished and with it, the influence of the Ottoman Empire over this region also ended. At the same time, you have the first waves of Jewish people returning to the land. There weren't big numbers. Before I continue, I want to stress, however, that some Jewish people remained in the land over the years. There never was a 100% exile of the Jewish people from the Promised Land, and a very small remnant was there over the years. They have never left. But the Jewish community was certainly small and poor. Within Jerusalem, the Jews couldn't really settle within the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. So in 1857, a rich Jewish person by the name of Montefiore bought a piece of land next to the old city and built a mill for the Jewish people living in Jerusalem. This was one of the first Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem after a very long time. 
So Montefiore had this idea of building this mill and activating the Jewish community that was very poor and they would make flour and then be profitable. But it didn't work according to the plan. The mill actually never worked and just stayed there as a monument. What was however successful is that the Jewish community, the Jewish settlement did survive and you had first Jewish settlements in and around Jerusalem begin popping up. And today you can see this neighborhood if you are looking from the Jaffa Gate. You can see it, it's very beautiful and the mill actually was restored according to its original plans in 2012, so it's working today. Another type of settlement that was happening in the 20th century were the kibbutz and the kibbutzim people. These were settlements based on socialism coming from the Soviet Union. Now I know that, especially in America, when you say socialism, it has a lot of bad connotations. But actually in Israel, this is the only place where socialism worked. And the reason it worked was that it wasn't forced by the government, it was created by the people, so it was growing from the bottom up. So it was a will of the people who wanted to live like this and not the government saying you have to live like this. And even today you can visit many kibbutzes that are all around Israel. Now today some of them transformed into a socialistic system to a capitalistic system, but that's another discussion. For example, many of the settlements that were attacked on October 7 were kibbutzes. So again, after World War I, this whole region was transformed. The Ottoman Empire ceased to exist because it allied itself with the Germans and they lost the war. So now this whole territory was governed by the ones that won the war. So as you can see on this map, the territory was divided between France and the British. And this is actually when the term Palestine is used again. The British went back using this ancient term given to the region by the Romans to make the Jews angry and implemented it in its new strategy that was written out in the Balfour Declaration. Now, we'll get back to the Balfour Declaration in a moment, but I want you to see that this is the time when the countries that you see today were actually formed. And it was quite grotesque how those countries were created. Basically, the British and the French sat down next to a table with a map and they started drawing up lines, creating new countries. So when Palestinians start shouting that they had this country for centuries and now the Jews came and took it from them, it's simply not true. First of all, there never was a country like Palestine. Never, you will not find it. There was no king, there was no president of Palestine, there wasn't such. Second, the term Palestine referred to a region and not at all times. Remember, in the Ottoman Empire it was not named that. But the British came back to it and they came back to this term that was created by the Romans to get Jews angry. And it was not named after Palestinians, it was named after Philistines that were long gone. But what I would like you to remember is that the boundaries of the countries that you see today in the Near East were actually made in the 20th century after World War I. Before that, all those territories were ruled by the Ottoman Empire. Before we'll get back to the Balfour Declaration by the British, we have to talk about what happened in Basel, Switzerland. So here, at that time, when the idea of creating a Jewish state in the so-called Palestine was not even considered on a serious level, Theodor Herzl, a journalist, on the first Jewish Congress said, there needs to be a Jewish state in Palestine. 
If only he knew the significance of those words. When he said them, everybody laughed and said, "It's a joke. It's impossible." Theodor Herzl was not a believer. He was not a religious man. He believed in the enlightenment of people, that humanity is going forward, and soon. The problems will be solved, but then something happened in France. So one of the most enlightened countries in Western Europe, a military man, Alfred Dreyfus, of Jewish descent, was sentenced for treason. It was a highly controversial case in France, and it wasn't the sentence that was controversial. It was what happened around it. First of all, the accusations were false. And was proven that they were false, but also the people around this case showed extreme measures of anti-Semitism, and those were the enlightened people. And when that happened, something clicked in Theodor Herzl. It was a fuel that led Herzl to write the book *Judenstadt*, a case. For a Jewish state in Palestine, but from this book to actually creating a Jewish state, there was a long way. When everybody at the Congress was laughing at Theodor Herzl, he said, "I know it looks impossible today, but if you will it, it's not a dream." And what is extraordinary is at this particular Congress in 1897, also said, "Okay, it may not happen in five years, it may not happen in ten years, but it will happen in 50 years." And what happens 50 years after those words? To the exact day, month, there is a famous UN vote for the partition of Palestine between a Jewish state. In a Palestinian state. Now, what is incredible about this is that the partition plan was not great for the Jewish people, but it was something. It was certainly more than nothing. But if you look at the actual lands that the Jewish people were supposed to get, so the territory that is not in green, those were to be Jewish territories. So if you look at those territories, most of it is the Negev Desert. But despite this fact that most of this territory was a desert, the Jews didn't accept this plan, and the Palestinians didn't. I want to repeat this: the Palestinians did not accept this land, which was great for the Palestinian people. So the question is: what has happened? What has happened to the world that the nations finally said, "It is time. It's okay." For the Jewish nation to be created. Well, two world wars. First, World War One, which we talked about, that changed the structure of the Middle East, and then World War Two. But this is where I want to finish this episode. There is still a lot of good stuff that we need to cover, and I will do it. In my next episode in this series, so make sure you don't miss it. So we will finish the story of exactly how Israel was created. For now, I want to thank everybody who has watched till the end. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, like this video if you think it was good, and also hit that bell button to be notified when new videos will be published. Also, big big thanks to everybody who's supporting the channel. Your support is vital for this channel. So thank you so much for your trust, and I hope、um, the information I'm providing is useful to you.、Uh, so I want to thank you to all the people that supporting the channel on Patreon. If you would like to support, if you like this kind of work that I'm doing, you can support the channel through Patreon. I will leave a link in the description of this episode for you 
to easily find. This is the best way to support me and my work. With that, I want to finish. Have a great week. Shalom.